The title of our sermon this morning is The Glory of the Triune God. The Glory of the Triune God. If you're new to our church or you're visiting with us today, we've taken a relatively brief break from our usual practice of verse-by-verse sequential exposition through books of the Bible. That's what we ordinarily do. We've taken a brief break from that, um, and we've set out on a series we're calling The Essentials, where each week through various important texts in the Bible, we're looking at biblical, foundational, biblical truths that are foundational to the faith that we profess as the people of God. Our approach to this series will still be biblical exposition, but topical exposition, if you will. Our aim is to address each subject from the text of Scripture in one sermon, (laughs) which is kind of like trying to describe someone you love in a single word. It's it's difficult to do. Like trying to describe a sunset or a sunrise in one word. Look out over the ocean, describe the beauty of that in one word. Like trying to describe lasagna in one word. It's very difficult to do that. So uh, each subject that we're taking a look at, uh, each subject about which volumes have been written, we're giving a brief introduction, so to speak. A 30,000-foot flyover, a foot in the front door. We could call it a string of pearls, right? A series of small studies on great subjects. Our hope is to put together a resource that we can use for new members to our church, newcomers to our church, or as an aid to give new believers, to give them a solid foundation in the faith. But for the more seasoned saints among us who have been with us for a while, I pray this is also going to be a benefit and a blessing to you. It helps us to learn more about the living God that we serve. Amen? That we might know Him who is true, that we would know His revealed Word more fully so that we might worship Him more faithfully. These doctrines give us a solid foundation for our faith, whereby we might love Him more fervently, whereby we might serve Him more devotedly, obey Him more joyfully. In other words, a study like this one is a worthwhile endeavor for every single one of us. Not simply to inform the mind, but to renew the mind. It's no mystery in Scripture that theology transforms how we think, and how we think impacts, influences how we live, how we act, how we love, how we trust, how we worship, how we obey. In other words, theology, theos lagos, right, the knowledge of God, is fuel to our affections for God. Theology fuels our affections for God. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, that being said, we embark today on the doctrine of God. And the subject that will occupy our attention this morning in our study of the essentials is the Trinity. Now, immediately, immediately we're hit in the face with how how crazy our one subject, one sermon plan really is, okay? Um, We're attempting to climb Everest before lunch. Uh, We're standing on an iceberg, and we're looking at an ice crystal. (laughs) We're going to do our best, however. This is simply an introduction. I hope it provokes you to more study. I hope it provokes you to more reading. The truth is we're never going to reach the top or the summit of this Everest. Never. And we will have an eternity of joyful progress in the ascent. (laughs) This is something we'll consider together for all of eternity. Listen to the words of Spurgeon. Spurgeon says this. He says, There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can compass and grapple with. In them, we feel a kind of self-content, and we go our way with the thought, behold, I am wise. But when we come to this master science, finding that our plumb line cannot sound its depth, and that our eagle eye cannot see its height, we turn away with the thought, 
that vain man would be wise, but he is like a wild ass's colt with solemn exclamation, I am but of yesterday and know nothing. No subject of contemplation will tend more to humble the mind than thoughts of God. Now, why is that? It's because God is incomprehensible. God is incomprehensible. His judgments unsearchable. His ways past finding out. No matter how much we may occupy our heart and mind with contemplations of God, He is ultimately beyond our finite comprehension. The finite cannot contain or exhaustively comprehend the infinite. We cannot grasp the infinite. Isaiah 55, the Lord tells us, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The majestic and infinite God who inhabits eternity, dwells in unapproachable light. No one can even see him and live. Right? Moses was just giving a, given a passing glance at his backside and any more would have killed him. God is incomprehensible. In addition to being incomprehensible, God is incomparable. Incomparable. Isaiah 40, listen to the words of the prophet. Verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? Verse 25, to whom then will you liken me, God says, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. The error that we most often make is attempting to fashion our understanding of this incomprehensible, incomparable God after our understanding of fallen man. That's exactly what not to do in the pursuit of an understanding or knowledge of God. God is not like you and I. His ways are not our ways. If we do that, we end up in idolatry. Right? We end up in idolatry. Isaiah 46, verse 5, To whom will you liken me then, and make me equal, and compare me that we should be alike? For I am God, verse 9, there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. However, to say that God is incomprehensible and to say that God is incomparable is not to say that God is entirely unknowable. We were created to know and to worship God. You were created, you were made, fearfully and wonderfully made, to know God and to worship Him. There is much that we can know about God because what may be known about God has been revealed. It's been revealed to us by God Himself. Among the infinite secret things that belong to God alone, there are those things which have been revealed to us that belong to us and our children forever. Those things necessary to our redemption. Those things necessary to our salvation. Those things necessary to being reconciled to Him as our Creator and our Redeemer. Those things revealed in the person and work of His Son, applied by the Spirit. Those things by which we may know Him who is true in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. John says, that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what's Christ what Christianity is all about. That's what your Christian life is all about, that you may know him who is true, that you may worship him who is true, that you may love him, trust him, obey him, that we must know him, that we would know him as he has been revealed to us. The living God, the one who has created all things, the one who has wonderfully made you, has revealed himself to us in his word. The Puritan, Stephen Charnock, said this. He says, it is impossible 
to honor God as we ought unless we know him as he is. It is impossible to honor God as we ought to unless we know him as he is. The only way that we're going to know him as he is is by taking heed according to his word, learning of him in his word. We must learn of him. That's why theology is so important, brothers, sisters. Right? His nature, his attributes, his ways, his works, his mighty deeds, don't neglect God's word to you. Right? You have a Bible. Read your Bible. Learn of him. Worship him. Learn good theology. We need good theology. So how has God then been revealed to us in his word? Now bear in mind, as we consider the answer to that question, that even what has been revealed to us in his word is more than we can lay hold of in this life. We'll be learning of those things, those truths for all of eternity. And as we've considered previously now, that God, God is first revealed to us through general revelation. His invisible attributes, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And God is revealed through special revelation, through his revealed word. Most preeminently, most supremely in the person and work of the Logos, the Word, His only begotten Son. That's through that means of God's Word, through the means of the Logos, the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, that God reveals Himself as triune. It's the Word of God that reveals the Trinity. The Trinity. Now that word Trinity is not in Scripture. You're not going to find it in the Bible. It's a theological term. And that theological word used to describe what it is that Scripture reveals about God. You have someone comes to you and objects. Well, the word Trinity is nowhere in the Bible. Yes, but everything the Trinity represents is. <laughs> the Trinity is a theological term used to represent what it is that the Scripture clearly, undeniably, inarguably reveals about God. That word was coined by the second century theologian Tertullian. And it's used to refer to the one indivisible or simple divine essence that subsists in three persons, right? The one indivisible or simple divine essence that subsists in three persons. One God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, immediately, we, we can recognize this as something that is incomprehensible and incomparable, can't we? We're talking about something that's inexplicable, something infinite. It can't be understood by finite reason. And yet it's true. Why? Because it's revealed in God's Word. We understand it in as much as it's been revealed because the Word of God teaches it. Something infinite cannot be understood by our finite reason. We can only understand the Trinity so far as it is revealed in the Bible. And this crucial doctrine has been revealed. This crucial, crucial doctrine has been revealed. People get themselves in significant trouble when they set out to subject what may be known of God to human reason. When they subject what the Bible says, or what the Bible teaches, when they subject what the Bible reveals about a subject like this, which is so incomprehensible and so inexplicable, when they subject that truth to human reason, it's a damning error. People reject the Trinity because they don't understand it. Man says in his pride that all truth is subject to my reason, subject to my understanding. If I can't understand it, if it makes no rational sense to me, a finite rational creature, then it must not be true. Right, and they reject the Trinity. That is damning error. Our God is incomprehensible. The Bible doesn't set out to prove the existence of the Trinity. The Bible simply reveals the doctrine of the Trinity. And then the Bible, in revealing the doctrine of the Trinity, lays upon us an obligation to believe it. Okay? It's in the same way, just like the Bible doesn't set out to prove the existence of God. The Bible is presuppositional. The Bible doesn't set out to prove the existence of God. The Bible simply declares that he exists, 
The Bible presupposes God and simply reveals him. And then it lays upon us the obligation to believe. The one who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Turn there with me. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. (laughs) From the very first chapter, in the very first verse, the Bible simply reveals the existence of God. Presupposes and declares Him. The Bible doesn't prove purpose or intend to prove that God exists. The Bible simply declares that He does. In the beginning, God. In the very same way, the Bible doesn't set out to prove the doctrine of the Trinity. The Bible simply declares the Trinity. The Bible simply reveals the Trinity. The Bible in multiple ways across the length and breadth of God's redemptive revelation simply declares that the Trinity is so. And he does that from the very beginning. Look at verse 1. In the beginning, God. That is the word Elohim. And that word is plural. (laughs) In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Drop down to verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God, Elohim, created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There's a plurality of persons being referenced here, right? And someone might come along and say, well, that's what they did with important people, kings in those times. They would often use a a, a lordship plurality or a ruling or a reigning plurality. No. The word for God is plural. And then God uses plural pronouns. There's a plurality of persons being referenced here. Let us make man in our image. Even the name of God, Elohim, is plural. In God's unity, right from the beginning, there is an obvious plurality. Now, only God can create. Only God creates. Ex nihilo, out of nothing, God creates. So what is meant by this plurality then in the very opening verses of the Bible? God is referenced in a plurality. God creates, and we see in verse 1, the Spirit of God found operative in creation in verse 2, hovering over the face of the waters. Listen to this from Psalm 33, verse 6, and turn on your Trinitarian ears as you listen to this. Psalm 33, in verse 6, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Mentioned here again is the word, the Lord, who here is Yahweh, and the breath. Job chapter 33, verse 4. Job says, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Now what then is shadowy, you could say even somewhat mysterious in the Old Testament, then bursts forth in technicolor splendor in the New Testament. John chapter 1, verse 1, considering all that we just read in the Old Testament, and that's just a a sampling of the very first chapter in the Bible. Now listen to John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Well, wait a minute, I thought that only God created. That's right. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing that was was made that was made. In him was life. I thought God was the source of life. That's right. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him, by the word, by the Lord Jesus Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. In other words, all things, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things consist. 
and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Scripture reveals that God creates. And in the Scriptures, from beginning to end, we see the Father operative in creation, we see the Son or the Word operative in creation, and we see the Spirit or the breath operative in creation. Therefore, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are God. It simply cannot be understood otherwise. It explains the plurality, doesn't it, of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. We see how the Bible in that, don't we? We see how the Bible doesn't set out to explain the doctrine of the Trinity, but rather we see how the Bible merely sets out, simply sets out to reveal that it is so. It reveals the doctrine of the Trinity. And then in the very opening words of God's revelation to man, we see that glorious truth. Now the Bible reveals the doctrine of the Trinity like that in many ways. In many ways, many ways, the Bible does the same thing in the same way, revealing the truth of the Trinity. One way we just saw was through the biblical account of creation, just one example. But there are many ways in which the Bible reveals this doctrine. And the more you understand your Bible, the more you read your Bible, the more that you read your Bible through that lens, the more that you see the doctrine of the Trinity all over the place. It is everywhere in the Bible, everywhere in the Bible. So if we take all that revelation, right? That's just one, we have an hour, right? It's just one taste of that. If we take all that revelation and then we summarize what the Bible teaches about God, we come to two very basic but profound conclusions about who God is and then a host of theological implications flow from that, those conclusions, okay? The first conclusion that we arrive at is this. There is but one true and living God. Our first conclusion from the summary of what the Bible teaches about God, the first conclusion is this. There is but one true and living God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, we have what is the first and great confession of faith of the people of God under the Old Covenant. It's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord there is Yahweh. Yahweh, singular. Our God is the word Elohim. Elohim, plural, the Lord, Yahweh, is one. The Lord, Yahweh, our God, Elohim, is one. Meaning, there is one infinite and eternal and unique and immutable and supreme and preeminent and eternal being. And although there are consistent references in the Bible, throughout the Bible, to the gods of the pagan nations around Israel, or even in the New Testament to the God of this age, all little g, right? He, Yahweh, is the one true and living God. Those other gods are supposed gods. They are no gods at all. No other God is or can be God. No other little g God is or can be big g God because no other little g God can be infinite can be eternal, can be immutable, can be supreme. The one who is infinite, eternal, immutable, and supreme is big G, God. Do you see? Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. Many assertions there about who God is, right? Did you get those? Before him, no God formed nor shall there be any God formed after him. 
I, even I, am the Lord. Besides me, there is no Savior. Besides God, Yahweh, there is no Savior. That's going to be very important as we consider the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ in a future sermon. Consider with me Isaiah 44, beginning in verse 6. Go ahead and turn there with me since we're in Isaiah. The Gospel of the Old Testament. Isaiah 44. <clears throat> Look there beginning at verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. He says, I am the first... I am the last, besides me there is no God. Who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show who show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock I know not one. Verse 24. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. Now remember, this was unique in Israel at the time, right? Very unique because of the pagan nations around Israel were all polytheistic there was a pantheon of pagan gods at their disposal, right? The Egyptian pantheon of gods that the Lord mocked and derided with the plagues under Moses. There were the Baals and the Asherahs. We see those in the book of Judges, of the gods of the Canaanites. God is saying those are no gods at all. Besides him, there is no other. The consistent teaching of the Bible is an uncompromising monotheism. Monotheism, there is but one God. Jesus refers to himself, re refers to him, refers to Yahweh as the only true God. Paul refers to him as the one living and true God. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So the Bible, start to finish, Old Testament and New Testament, clearly affirms that God is one, that God is one. He is the true and living God, the one who is infinite, immutable, eternal, incomprehensible, incomparable. Besides him, there is no other God. First conclusion, there is but one true and living God. And that then leads us to our second inarguable and undeniable assertion of the Bible with respect to God. That one God exists in three persons who are themselves God. That one God exists in three persons. One of the ways in which the Bible clearly affirms the doctrine of the Trinity is by revealing the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and by revealing the deity of the Holy Spirit. The three members of the Godhead all are God. God exists, one God exists in three persons. A sermon addressing the deity of Christ is fast approaching in this series or this study of the essentials. But it'll have to suffice for now to look at just a couple of examples of this biblical truth. The deity of Christ, like the doctrine of the Trinity, is all over the Bible. The deity of the Lord Jesus Christ all over the Bible, most clearly revealed in the New Testament, but also clearly, inarguably seen in the Old Testament, both through explicit statements and through implicit statements that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, is God, the second person of the Trinity. Now first, we're in Isaiah. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 7. In the Old Testament, we see the prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ in the coming Messiah, and we see in this a picture of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ giving credence to the truth of the Trinity. Look at Isaiah chapter 7, 
Look at verse 14 there. Isaiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does the word Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. It means God with us. Pretty good indication that the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who is to come, is going to be God with us. Flip the page, Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This one whose name shall be Emmanuel, or God with us, is described here in verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, El Gibor, Mighty God, Parent of Perpetuity. It's what that means, Everlasting Father. It means Father of Forever. Jesus Christ is the Father of Forever. El Gibor, Mighty God, Emmanuel, God with us. Flip over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, there are so many more in Isaiah. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. And look there beginning at verse 5. Jeremiah 23, beginning in verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. Now he's going to raise to David a descendant, a son of David, right? A branch of righteousness, a king. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord. That word is Yahweh, our righteousness. He will be called Yahweh, our righteousness. This is one who is a savior when God is the only savior. And besides him, there is no savior. This is the one who is called El Gibor, mighty God, when there are no other gods besides him. This is the one who is the parent of perpetuity, the father of forever. This is the Lord Yahweh, our righteousness. Now flip over to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Bringing this home in the New Testament. Look there, beginning in Matthew chapter 1 at verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus is a word, Yeshua. It means Yahweh saves. <laughs> That's what the, the name Jesus means. Yahweh saves for he. Who's the he? Yahweh saves. Jesus will save his people from their sins. God said that there would be no savior but him. Besides me, there is no savior. And here is one who is born and his name means Yahweh saves. Verse 22, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife, did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. This is none other than the Messiah, none other than the branch who is Yahweh, our righteousness. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself incarnate. The word then became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you see? And so much more that could be said. And more will be.
All right, more will be. Suffice it to say for now that Jesus Christ is God. Right? And the New Testament declares it to be so. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. We'll look at this more when we get to the deity of Christ. Listen to this from Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. It's a common objection of the cults, especially with regard to Genesis chapter 1, that when the Lord says, let us make man in our image, God is standing in a company of angels, and the us refers to both God and the angels. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. One, man wasn't created in the image of angels. Man was created in the image of God. To which of the angels, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5, to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, it's another objection of the cults, that the firstborn over all creation or the firstborn refers to the first created one. That's a lie. It's not understanding protogeniture or the rights of the firstborn. He is the firstborn over all creation because he's the one who created all things. He is the firstborn from the dead, not because he is the, the first one who is resurrected, right? But because he is the preeminent one who is resurrected. He says, I will be a father to him, he shall be to me a son. When he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, to the Son, God, Yahweh, says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You are the branch, Yahweh, our righteousness. Right? You have loved righteousness, hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you... Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, immutable, and your years will not fail, eternal. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? In other words, he would never say that to an angel. But he does say it of the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the branch, our righteousness. Are they not all just ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Jesus Christ is God. So many texts, so many texts. We'll look at those at a future date. We also know from the Bible that the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. The Holy Spirit is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, the Bible, not setting out or purposing or intending to prove the doctrine of the Trinity or to explain the doctrine of, of the Trinity, but simply to reveal the doctrine of the Trinity, says this in Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, they sold a possession and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought out a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Who is he lying to? The Holy Spirit. And to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. Again, it, it wasn't sin for Ananias and Sapphira to have kept back part of the land for themselves. They could have decided to do that very thing, but they didn't. They lied to the Holy Spirit, okay? So keep in mind here um, what the judgment is for. While it remained, was it not your own, verse 4, and after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. 
lied to the Holy Spirit. Lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last. And great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Young men arose, wrapped them up, carried them out, buried them. His wife came in, said the same, buried her with him. We'll look at this more when we get to the subject of the person and work of the Holy Spirit, which is also a sermon coming soon. Jesus Christ is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Two clear, basic, profound conclusions. There is but one true and living God, and that one God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now this has profound implications seen clearly all over the Bible. Profound implications. We think about these sermons and wanting, desiring to think about this good, gloriously good truth that we learn from these doctrines taught in Scripture. But it's not information for the sake of information. Right? It's information for the sake of transformation. It should be information that fills the heart and mind and changes you from the inside out. And this doctrine is no exception. Let me give you just a couple, just a couple of many implications of this doctrine seen clearly all over the Bible. One, the first is this. It's impossible to truly understand the gospel apart from an understanding of the Trinity. It's impossible to understand God's saving work apart from an understanding of God as Trinity. It's impossible. Peter says this. Peter says that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Listen to this from Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. We see Abba, Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit. Interesting here in Galatians 4, it's the Spirit of His Son. The, Son, the Spirit of God proceeding both from the Father and from the Son. Listen to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There's so many texts like that in the Bible where the Trinity is all over the text. God the Father working in our redemption. God the Son working in our redemption. Holy Spirit working in our redemption. Perfect economy of labor in the Godhead to secure the redemption of His prized possession, His people. Ephesians chapter 1. The Father chooses us before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1, in His Son, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of His sins, and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Every time the gospel is revealed or unfolded in the, in the Scriptures, there is an explicit or implicit reference to the work of the triune God in our redemption. Spurgeon says this, A gospel without the Trinity? It is a pyramid built upside down. <laughs> a gospel without the Trinity? It is a rope of sand that cannot hold together. A gospel without the Trinity? Then clearly Satan can overturn it. But give me a gospel with the Trinity and all the power of hell cannot prevail against it. 
No man can any more overthrow it than a bubble could split a rock or a feather break a mountain in two. Gain an understanding of the Trinity, Spurgeon continues, and you have discovered the heart of all divinity. Understand that the three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are one. Then all things will appear clear. This is the golden key to the secrets of nature, and he who understands this will soon understand as much as mortals can ever know. We need to have a biblical understanding of the Trinity to understand the gospel and the work of God in our redemption, right? If you're here today and you are not saved, you've never turned from your sin to trust Christ alone, then consider our glorious triune God, the one who has done such miraculous works to secure the redemption of his people. Turn from your sin and trust him alone. Cry out to the Spirit of God to do that work in your heart. Right? Cry out to God to save you. Secondly, just another of many. It's impossible to effectively understand or to live the Christian life apart from a biblical understanding of the Trinity. We simply cannot live effectively the Christian life apart from the Trinity. You might ask the question, what practical help is there in this doctrine? Right? Some Think of it as an academic pursuit. We're just going to study the Trinity, but there's no practical use for that at all. It is in every way practical. In every way practical. Listen to the words of Jude in verse 20. Listen to this. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You want a schematic of the Christian life? There you go, all right? A step-by-step. -step. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> Build yourselves up on your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, for through him, through Jesus Christ, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now think with me for a moment and consider how just that one thought would change the way that you pray, should influence the way that you pray. For through Him, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Think about how we worship together. Through Him, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Think about when you obey Him. It's through Christ that we have access by one Spirit to the Father. Think about battling, your, battling sin, right? the mortification of the flesh. It's through Him that we have access by one Spirit to the Father. We need to be more Trinitarian in our worship, more Trinitarian in our prayer, more Trinitarian in our thoughts, more Trinitarian in our faith, more Trinitarian in our obedience, more Trinitarian in our battle against sin. Right? More Trinitarian in our reading of the Bible. More Trinitarian in our fellowship. More Trinitarian in our praise. Certainly, we need to be more Trinitarian in our knowledge of God. Augustine said this. He said, In no other subject is error more dangerous or inquiry more laborious or discovery of truth more profitable. Considering the words of Augustine there, let me encourage you and I together in this. Inquiry into subjects like this is laborious. It takes hard, diligent work. It takes labor in the word and doctrine. And, no dis and the discovery of truth is profitable, Augustine says, Right? It is worth our effort. It is worth our time. It is worth our energy. Read the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Memorize the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God, right? Learn of God in His Word. It is worth the effort. Is not the chief end of man to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever? Then to know God as He is is required in order to glorify Him as He is and to enjoy Him as He is. 
And he is the blessed three in one and one in three. Amen. All praise, honor, and glory to our triune God. Let's pray. I want you to take just a moment and pray to the Lord in gratitude for having revealed these truths to worms such as we are and having glorified himself in such a way and then consider how we might glorify him and how we might worship him and praise him and thank him uh, for who he is, to know him as he is and to worship him rightly. And then we'll pray together and conclude. Let's pray. Our glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I praise you, Father, that you have sought us. Lord Jesus Christ, that you have bought us. Spirit of God, that you have wrought within us his saving blessings and benefits. And now look to you in awe and in wonder, in gratitude and love and devotion and faith and praise and worship you, our triune God. Help us, Lord, uh, to consider you as you have revealed yourself to us in your word. Help us, Lord, to be faithful, to learn of you, to study you, to take joy in uh, the discovery of these beautiful, um, matchless, insurpassable realities. Uh, And with grateful hearts, Lord, worship and praise you for having revealed yourself in this way to us. And may we glorify you and enjoy you forever. Um, You are our portion. Uh, You are our inheritance. And we love you, Lord. And may our worship of you be in spirit and in truth. Uh, May our praise of you be in keeping with who you are. And may our obedience to you be full and joyful in the power that you've supplied and the way that you've decreed. May our devotion to you, Lord, be um, Trinitarian. We thank you, Lord, for this glorious truth. Uh, this glorious truth. I pray that you would spur us on to um, greater study, um, greater understanding. In the Spirit of God, you would lead us into truth as we do. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.